Tonight, Peter Costello forced to rule out a post-election leadership challenge. A huge party closes the unforgettable Dream Games. And a marathon gold chance ruined by a crazed protester. That is cool. From our new studio in the heart of Sydney, this is 7 News with Ian Ross. Good evening. Round one and the gloves are off in the federal election campaign. The question of who voters can trust turning into accusations of lying and Peter Costello forced to rule out a leadership challenge after the poll. It's day one and the race to accuse the other of lying is a dead heat. Well, I think he's told the first porky of the election campaign. The first big Latham lie of this election campaign. Mr Howard accuses his opponent of lying about whether he'd impose a national payroll tax. I've not heard that uh, suggestion before and uh, uh, Labor's got uh, absolutely no intention of doing that or anything, anything like it. But the government says Labor proposes something very much like it in its workplace relations policy. A 0.1% levy on payrolls to guarantee workers' entitlements. Either he's lying or he doesn't understand his own party's policy. They haven't just said this in one policy, by the way. They've said it in three. And they describe it as a tax in each and every one. Mr Latham says that's untrue. Labor's been proposing the increase to the government's own superannuation guarantee levy for the past two and a half years. Mr Costello, like his Prime Minister, is telling porkies, Mr Costello was saying it's described as a tax. It's not. It's described as a levy. When's a tax a levy? Normally when tax is a four-letter word. Labor sees this as an elaborate diversion from what it claims is the first big slip of the campaign, Peter Costello's contortions over his Prime Ministerial ambitions. People can look at my record. Can you rule out any challenge to John Howard's leadership in the next three years? Won't and do it? I am, I am telling you, look at my record. Later forced to clear that up with a definitive statement standing alongside the Prime Minister. I have ruled out challenging. I'm not challenging. Would you like anything else? And the usual fight over debates has also begun. Mr Howard wants one, but more like a televised news conference than the traditional match-up with a single moderator. I think on this occasion it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a panel of journalists provide a bit of variety. I think it's better to have a fair dink and rigid edge debate. One on one, me and Mr Howard, head to head, toe to toe, let's get it on. In Canberra, Mark Riley, 7 News. Keen to shore up Labor support in Western Sydney, Mark Latham has weighed into the political row over the closure of the Orange Grove factory outlet. He suggested it's not too late to reopen businesses there. It's not unusual for Mark Latham to disagree with Bob Carr, but on the issue of Orange Grove, he hasn't said much until now. And if there's an argument for rezoning the site, if that was the fair thing to do, and allow those retail chains to re-establish themselves, uh, then that should happen. There should be fair play. Mr Latham's not saying the Premier definitely got it wrong. He wants the inquiries now running to report back first. But State Opposition Leader John Brogdon seized on the comments anyway. Even Mark Latham supports the workers of Orange Grove and even Mark Latham disagrees with Bob Carr when it comes to whether or not Orange Grove should remain open. Mr Brogdon says Mark Latham is now distancing himself from Bob Carr, worried the Premier will cost him votes in the coming federal poll. Mr Latham is worried that Bob Carr's mishandling of Orange Grove is going to hurt him in the federal election in six weeks' time. The parliamentary inquiry into this affair today heard how the minister responsible, Diane Beamer, received advice from the Premier's office describing the Orange Grove development as seedy and highly suspicious. But that wasn't interpreted as a reason to knock back its rezoning. He gave us advice. He said take care. He did not give a directive. Phil Black, 7 News. A bizarre protest has marred the final event of the Games and cost a Brazilian competitor a likely gold medal. Vanderlei de Lima was leading when someone jumped from the crowd grabbing him. He still finished, earning a special award for his courage. Competition over and the medal tally is finalised. The US and China finished on top. Russia pushed Australia into fourth place, but 17 gold is our best ever Games result. A coronial inquiry into patient deaths at three Sydney hospitals has found they have no case to answer. An earlier inquiry into Campbelltown, Camden and Liverpool hospitals asked the coroner to reopen those files, but he says no further investigation is necessary.
today's decision by the coroner not to investigate further these 14 cases again highlights the need for a public inquiry, a Royal Commission, into the deaths at these hospitals. 19 other deaths are still before the coroner. Drivers have named Mona Vale as Sydney's worst road. The result has surprised the NRMA, triggering calls for billions to be spent upgrading city arterials and country highways. Single lane in each direction, Mona Vale Road at Terry Hills judged Sydney's worst by 13,000 members of the NRMA. It should be two lanes all the way. The traffic's appalling. I mean, it needs to be dual carriageway, I think. In April last year, two teenage boys were killed in a horror smash on the road, which runs through the opposition leader's electorate. It is a goat track and it's a death trap. But the NRMA chief was surprised by the result. There are other roads which our people are familiar with, such as um, Parramatta Road, um, which would be more obvious. In fact, Parramatta Road was ranked fifth. Considered worse were Pennant Hills Road, Camden Valley Way and Windsor Road. The Prince's Highway topped the list of state roads, closely followed by the Pacific and Hume Highways. But the NRMA says the solution to making our roads safe is really pretty simple. We need to spend a lot more money on them, at least $11 billion over the next decade. Every day, 500 people are hurt on the nation's roads. The healthcare cost is around $40 million. What we do know, that safer roads save lives. While we've had record levels of funding from the RTA on roads in New South Wales, we acknowledge that the community would like more to be spent. As for Monoval Road, the RTA says it has just spent $14 million upgrading it. Cassie Hamer, 7 News. Britain's super couple expecting another baby. Details next. Also, a special report into Sydney's critical shortage of preschool places. And a quarter of a million protest against George W. Bush. From Martin Place, this is 7 News. In the coming election, education will be a big issue, especially for parents discovering the critical shortage of preschool places across parts of Sydney. They'll be looking to federal leaders to help reduce waiting lists and soaring costs. Do some more. <laughs> do some more. Three-year-old Finn and his four-year-old sister Bella do pretty much everything together except preschool. He wants to be there and he loves it and he doesn't understand why he can't go. Despite being on the waiting list at Bella's preschool since birth, overwhelming demand meant all three-year-olds missed out on a place this year. I rang around everywhere and they just laugh at you. <laughs> because unless you've had their name down on a list, you just you haven't got a hope. Susanna says with private operators, she faced double the fees, $70 a day. So instead, Finn's at home. And one of our biggest non-profit preschool operators says the Roonies aren't alone. Um, some of our centres have 300, 400 waiting lists. She says shortages are worst in the eastern suburbs, inner west and north shore, while in other parts of Sydney, the fees are becoming unaffordable. Well, I fear if nothing is done, then preschools will just be the prerogative of, of affluent families. They rely on state government funding and say it's barely changed in 15 years, while rival long daycare centres have benefited from federal handouts. She's climbing up that side. New South Wales spends less on preschool per child than any other state. A government funding review started in March last year. Almost 18 months later, preschools are still waiting. The government argues Canberra should help and that parents want more choice. It's not like in days gone past when preschools were all that was available, so I think people need to recognise that. But parents like Susanna say preschool is their choice, one that's getting out of reach. Paul Caddack, 7 News. New York has played host to one of its biggest demonstrations since the Vietnam War. Hundreds of thousands took to the streets to voice their anger at President George Bush, who launches his re-election campaign there later this week. New York today sent George Bush a loud message. No You're not welcome. No more Bush. No more Bush. We are the majority of this country. The majority of this country opposes this war. The majority of this country wants 
the Bush administration out of office. Despite intense heat, up to 250,000 protesters clogged 45 blocks of the city. Stopping in front of Madison Square Garden, where the Republican convention starts tomorrow. Mock coffins were carried as a symbol of American soldiers who have died in Iraq. Thousands of police dressed in riot gear guarded every step. There were 200 arrests and one protest float was set alight in the streets. But most protesters were average Americans. Not since perhaps the Vietnam War has America been so divided in the lead up to an election. This demonstration, a graphic example of that division. We don't want Bush re-elected and we want the war in Iraq ended. I think this is the most important election of my generation. In New York, Mike A. Moore, 7 News. David Beckham's wife, Victoria, is pregnant, expecting a third child to join brothers Brooklyn and Romeo. Yeah, it's, it's great news. You know, um, Victoria's over three months pregnant now, so, uh, you know, we're very happy as a family. It means Posh fell pregnant around the time of speculation that the football star was having an affair with his Spanish personal assistant. Sport now with Matthew White and an AOC appeal to keep the money coming. Yeah, more cash is needed, Roscoe. That's if we want our Olympic success to continue in Beijing. We'll have more on that next. Plus, the Dragons reflect on their remarkable comeback. And a dramatic Belgian Grand Prix gives Michael Schumacher another championship. in place. This is 7 News. So George Illawarra has even more to celebrate tonight with the return of key players for the semi-finals. Luke Bailey, Mark Gaznia and Jason Riles are all on the mend, while the rest of the squad is still getting over yesterday's great escape. They weren't exactly walking on water, but anything seems possible for the Dragons after yesterday's great escape. Something you sort of dream about and, you know, come true. And, uh, the way we played and how we come back is, you know, pretty top things off. Down 34-10 against Manly with 20 to go. Even their fans had given up. I probably would have too if I was a supporter. But, um, you know, the, the, uh, the real fans really stuck, stuck with us and uh, they got the good show in the end. The Dragons grabbing five tries in 20 minutes to sneak home. We've seen bigger comebacks, but not better comebacks than this. And the news is good on Trent Barrett's injured groin. You know, we've got the bye, which is lucky, and, you know, I'll definitely be right in two weeks. So, too, prop Luke Bailey, who's coming back early from a torn pectoral muscle to play in the finals. I think it's a small risk compared to what's on offer. You know, worst-case scenario, I'll do it again, and I've got an off-season to get fixed up. So, you know, I'm looking at a pretty good position, I think. Good times, too, for diehard Cowboys fans there to greet their team at Townsville Airport after a 10-year wait for a finals berth. It's a bit of relief, but at the same time, there's a lot of satisfaction there. You know, we've made the semi-finals for the first time and no one will ever be able to take that away from us. And while Gordon Tallis has pulled on the helmet for a shot at go-karting, he's expected to confirm tomorrow he won't go around with the Broncos next year. I'm really not sure myself. Um, he is very old, though. You would think that retirement would be on the, on the cards. Patrick Mollohan, 7 News. Michael Schumacher has won his seventh Formula One Drivers' Championship after finishing second at the Belgian Grand Prix. The race was marred by several crashes, the worst on the opening lap involving Mark Webber. Oh, and the car off there. Rear suspension broken of... Oh, is uh, Wow, just missed him. Sartan and another spinner. They'll have to red flag it. We've now got a fire. I'm afraid... The rough and tumble continued. Jensen Button blowing a tyre at high speed and taking out a Minardi. Kimi Raikkonen avoided the trouble to win the race, but Schumacher's second placing is enough to secure another Drivers' Championship. And just a reminder for you, we have a replay of the closing ceremony from 8.30 tonight on 7. Roscoe, what do you think of our new home? Do you like working to a live audience? I love working it's to a live audience. The thing is now, our sport guys, we can't wear our board shorts. We have exactly. to suit up. You haven't looked under the desk yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Norla's next with weather live from the heart of Sydney. There she is, but first finance. Election jitters sent the market lower. BHP Billiton lost 18 cents. The ASX 200 dropped five points. Trade in Sons of Gualia suspended after it announced administrators have moved in. The Australian dollar fell on expectations the election will delay any interest rate rises.
Good evening and greetings from our new home. I've ventured outside for a bit of a recce and also to tempt the stubborn cloud that's been with us all day to finally start raining. I'm really asking for it actually, I don't even have an umbrella. So far there's only been a few spots but the forecast is for a little more patchy rain overnight. Right now though it's still fine and a relatively mild 19 degrees in Martin Place. In spite of the cloud, it was still quite warm today with temperatures up around 24 degrees across Sydney, 22 in Gosford. Colder and cloudy in the mountains with a little rain and a top of 13. On the charts, there's a fair bit of cloud in the east, care of a front and trough line. Some of that cloud did produce some reasonable falls in our central west today around Dubbo, but it thinned out as it reached Sydney. Temperatures will start to cool down gradually this week as the trough line moves through and the large high moves in. Interstate, wet in the southeast tomorrow with rain easing to showers in Melbourne, a shower or two in Adelaide. Hobart and Canberra clearing from Brisbane. On the waters, choppy tomorrow on a low swell with west to northwesterly winds around 15 to 25 knots, tending southwest to southerly in the evening. Hopefully, we'll see some rain tonight, but the sunshine will be back tomorrow. Not quite as warm as today. Tops around 21 degrees, cold and partly cloudy in Katoomba. And it looks like staying mild and fine for the rest of the week with some cloud about at times, especially near the coast, maybe even a coastal shower or two. For now, though, um, Roscoe, can I come in? I think I've taunted the weather fairies long enough. Can I come in now? Please, please. All right. Maybe we can do a rain dance with some of the commuters. No shortage of starters out there either. Thanks, <laughs> Nula. And that's seven years to now, our very first from Martin Place. I'm Ian Ross. Thanks for your company. Good night.